Now tonight we move along in our study in 1 Peter. We'll start with verse number 3. We had an introduction last week. But tonight we're going to be looking at something that every single one of us need to understand. And this passage is a very important passage because it'll help not only you and me when we go through hard times with trials and difficulties. Peter is speaking to, writing to, a group of people that are uh, uh, scattered and getting ready to go through the, the horrific tortures and persecutions that Nero put the early church through. So we're going to find out what Peter has to say in our study tonight, which is entitled, Sometimes Life Hurts. You know, I've had Christian people say, well, I'm a Christian. I shouldn't have all these problems. <laughs> no, every Christian can. Matter of fact, you're at war when you accept Christ. Exactly. Uh, you enter into a battle. So tonight we are in First Peter, and I wanted to start where we left off last week because verse number 7 is actually... The, the main verse of the entire book. For those of you <clears throat> that are watching by internet, you'll notice that we're in a different location because we're having some work done in the auditorium. So I hope this will be very clear for you to be able to follow. Now tonight in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, notice what Peter said. We read it last week. Let's look at it again. He said that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus. And so we see here that Peter is trying to help uh, those that, that have been scattered about, that are getting ready, just starting with the persecution that the Roman Empire was going to put the church through, and so he wanted to keep them encouraged. Peter emphasizes here that God care, God cares for us. And this is the this is the theme throughout the whole book. God cares for you, no matter what you're going through. We find here realizing the many facets of God's care uh, for you, for me, in the midst of trials, is uh, is important in getting through those trials successfully. Trials can make you better or they can make you bitter. And so many times people stop reading the Bible, stop praying, stop going to church when the trials come and they find that life gets harder instead of better. I want to start tonight by taking a look at a chart that we saw that was based on verse number seven last week. Peter said that the reason that we have or the purpose that we have trials is to help believers face and correctly handle life's trials and persecutions. God wants you to correctly handle them. Everybody's going to have them. A faith that can't be tested is a faith that can't be trusted. And so God wants you to build your muscles, your spiritual muscles. He doesn't want you to atrophy. And so God sends things your way to help you grow stronger in his and and that usually comes in trials or persecutions. He, Peter uses in verse number 7 the analogy of gold. He starts out by talking about gold being impure. Impure. And that relates to the fact that the believer who has not learned to live obediently for God may be saved, but they don't live obediently for God. They're still, uh, they're still filled with, with the, the dirt and the trappings of the world. That's gold that hasn't been tried. But what God does, He puts the gold through the fire. That's the trials. That's the things that, that we endure, no matter what it might be. And God puts us through that, the trials that burn away all the self-reliance and the sin in a believer's life. So we find here that as God puts us through the trials, we begin to realize we can't do it ourselves. I've had many of you always say in a hospital or at a funeral home, I don't know how people get through this without the Lord. And that's really what we come to realize when we find ourselves in the fiery uh, persecutions of life. And then we come forth as pure gold. And we see here that the believer, who, this is the believer who has learned to depend and to obey on God. We all start 
with carnalities and God uses the trials and the difficulties that we have to get us to lean on Him. And as we lean on Him, then we find that He is more than sufficient and we come forth as pure gold. Isn't that a wonderful analogy? Now, I want you to notice with me, in the first place, the, pre uh, the present position that we all have as believers. The present position, and we're going to start with verse number 3. In, pre in this present day and age, right now, every single one of us have a lively hope. A living, lively hope. Look at what he said in verse number 3. He says, there you go, a lively hope. Now he says in verse number 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You remember last week we talked about verse 1 and 2. And in verse 2 he said, it tells us about the election that we're saved by the election of God, by the sanctification of the Spirit, and by the sprinkling of the Son. And so the Trinity is involved in your salvation. God knew who you were and you're about your salvation before He ever created the first world or the first person or the first animal. There'd be no salvation for human beings, folks, without God taking the initiative and acting. God had to act. God sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says that God is seeking those who will be saved. And so God takes the initial step. And that's why when we go soul winning, first thing we should pray is, Lord, speak to their heart so that they can understand, so that they can see their need of Christ. So God's gracious actions then provide salvation, but they grow out of His mercy. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy. God's actions grow out of His mercy. Mercy is what, uh, what you don't get that you deserve. Grace is what you get that you don't deserve. Grace, you get heaven. Mercy, you don't get hell. You see the difference? And so he says that all of this grows out of the mercy of God, God's mercy. And how does he say? Look at verse 3. He said, according to his abundant mercy. The word according implies that God was impelled by his mercy. God was a merciful God and he had to do something so that you could be saved. He was impelled by his mercy rather than just acting in accordance with his, the fact that he's a merciful God. God was thrown into doing something for you and for me that we might be able to be saved. God's mercy drove him to do what? To provide salvation. To provide salvation. Now notice if you would. See if I can get this to change more. There we go. I knew we were going to start this is what it, I've had trouble with it like this all afternoon long all right let me get it. See if I can remember what I did to fix it before right now we find well, it's not going to change. All right. We find then that the compelling force of God's mercy is His merciful heart. And His merciful heart moved Him to provide salvation for you and for me. Now, I want you to look at verse number 3 again. Because He uses the word begotten. He said, that he, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten. In verse 23... He uses the word born again. Now, this particular verb is used only in these two places in the original language uh, in the Bible. It's only used in these two places, verse 23 and verse 3. And it means a renewal or the impartation of a new life 
through the seed of the Word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. God begot you by the Word and by the Holy Spirit. So our priceless salvation, our privileged position as sons of God, our enjoyment of eternal life didn't begin with us. It's not because of who you are or what race you are or the fact that you grew up in a Christian home. It had nothing to do with you. It's not our merit. It's not our discernment. It's not our better than average wisdom. Folks, listen. Rather, we got saved because of the abundant, compelling mercy of God. God's mercy is why you're saved. Now look again at verse 3. Every person who trusts Christ is born how? Unto a lively hope. A, li a living, lively hope that energizes us on a daily basis. Sometimes we get up and we don't, we don't even feel like we're saved. But the reality of it is that God saves us. It is a living and lively hope. And this living, energetic hope is an attitude of eager anticipation as well as blessed assurance. We are assured of what salvation means. And we are eager to see what God has prepared for us. All of that comes with the knowledge that we've been born again. So the foundation of this hope, look at the verse, the foundation of this hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead or from among the dead, literally. He came forth after He had died, after He was buried. He rose again. And because He rose again, we have hope that we also will be raised. Now, if you're writing on your paper, and I may not be able to change this for you, but write a reserved inheritance. A reserved, a reserved inheritance. That's what I had said before. No. Uh, it's just going back and forth. It doesn't like you. Going back and forth. Now, a reserved inheritance. Look at verse number four. You've got your papers there. Notice what he said. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So the Lord Himself is the inheritance of the child of God. We talk about heaven. We talk about all the things that God has for us, crowns and rewards. We talk about all of those things. But in all reality, we find, according to this Scripture, that the Lord Himself is your inheritance. We talk about Crowns. We talk about uh, we talk about uh, uh, mansions. We talk about all these things, but in reality, we are going to have the Lord Himself when we get to heaven. His presence alone, may I say, is eternally priceless. So, our Lord has reserved for His children heaven itself, and of course, that's uh, indescribable. We've talked about the eternal city in Revelation 21 and 22. He's provided for us the prepared mansions. And by the way, it's going to be greater than that because that's the greatest word they could come up with in the English language, but it doesn't even describe what God has for you. And also the glorious host of the redeemed. So God promised rewards at the Bema Seat, the judgment seat of Christ to those that have lived for the Lord Jesus. And we look forward to glorified bodies. They're going to be delivered from weariness. Amen? Delivered from disease and pain and physical limitations and to hearts that are free from sorrow. I look forward to that. And since the inheritance has already been set aside by God, uh, it's the most secure deposit in all of the universe. It can never be destroyed by the enemy. All that God has for you can never be destroyed by the enemy. It can never be, never diminish in value. And also, it can never be polluted. And it can never waste away. This is what the scripture says. God has it set aside for you 
and it's going nowhere. So it's an assured inheritance, which the Lord promises to deliver in, in all of its full value. Also notice, if you would, verse 5. He talked about a secure salvation. A secure salvation. Write that down. He says in verse number 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Did you see those words? Who are kept? Who are kept? That refers to those that have been born again, verse number 3. If you've been born again, He's talking about you here. Those who have an inheritance waiting for them in heaven, verse number 4. If you are born again and you've got an inheritance waiting for you in heaven, then you are kept. What does that mean? Believers are literally kept ones. Kept ones. Now folks, God continually performs the, this action on your behalf. God continually keeps you. The devil can't get to you. You can't lose that salvation. God keeps you continually. God continually does that because of His unbroken care. 24 hours every day. The believer is going to be on hand in heaven to receive His, rever his reserved inheritance. You've got to be there. God's got your inheritance. He's keeping it safe. You've got to be there because it's there for you. But not only that, the believer's assurance is not only, isn't uh, dependent on your strength, or your perfection of life, or your determination. It's rather God's strength and God's purpose will, you know, will guarantee the fact that you'll be there with the inheritance. Now notice the word faith in verse 5. Faith is the channel which relates us to that divine power. By faith in the Savior, the believer entered into the divine family. And now by faith, the believer claims the power of God that's acting on his behalf by faith. Even our faith, even our faith is a gift from God. Worked in us by the Holy Spirit, Romans 10, 17. Worked in us by the Holy Spirit so that in salvation, all boasting is gone. I don't care what race you are, what place you are, what grace you are. The fact of the matter is, you have nothing to boast about. God saved you. God keeps you. By the fact that you'll end up in heaven is only by the mercy of God. And so you have nothing to boast. Then he uses the term salvation in verse 5. The term salvation involves several truths. It includes justification. Justification is when you first get saved, you are saved from the power of or the penalty of sin. All sin. You've been justified. Then sanctified. You are being saved on a daily basis from the power of sin. Not only the, the fact that you had sin uh, in your life when you got saved, but now as you grow in the Lord, you become more like Christ. And then comes glorification when God separates you from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and then the presence of sin. We're in heaven. Now that's important because he says this will be in the last time when Christians experience the fullness. I mean, we got saved from our sin when we got saved. We're growing in the Lord right now. But we still don't have everything that salvation's got entailed for us because now we're waiting to be glorified, not even bothered by sin any longer. And so that's why he says this will happen in the end time. Now, let's take a look at the second point. The second point. The present trials of the believer. The present trials of the believer. And for this, we're going to start with verse number 6. What are we going through now? Uh, the, the title of this, the message tonight is sometimes life hurts. So what are we going through? Well, let's take a look first of all at the presence of trials. The presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, presence of trials. He says in verse number six, and this surprises some people, 
who've never been taught the scripture and they get discouraged when things come along. But he says in verse 6, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations or testings. The great rejoice. We greatly rejoice. When? In the last time. When we're glorified and our salvation is complete, we're going to shout glory. We're going to be glorified. We're going to rejoice when our testings are over. When Terry and I went overseas, mainly when I went overseas, because I don't believe you had shots to go overseas. We had to go get shots. I had to, because I was going into some areas where disease was very prevalent. I don't like shots. Not those anyway. But I sat down and I said, I don't want this shot. And they said, well, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to Romania. I'm going to Mexico. You know, They said, this shot will last only a second, but you're going to have a good time for a long time. Well, that's the way these tests are. They hurt for a moment, but one day we're going to be delivered from every bit of it. We're going to be glorified. We're going to be glorying in the fact that the trials that we now go through are not even worthy to be compared with what God has prepared for us and the rewards that we get having come forth as pure gold. Trials are for now, verse 6 says. And for a season, he says. Not for eternity. We don't go through trials for eternity. By the way, let me say this. Faith is a present grace. It is a present grace. Faith is not a grace we'll have in heaven. Why? When faith becomes sight, you don't need faith anymore. Right? So faith is something that we have here on this earth. We get home, it's not that we're going to have to have faith because we'll be in heaven. Consequently, any testing of your faith has to be here. You won't be tested in heaven. Your faith is tested here, so it'll grow. Amen. Life on this earth is where we're candidates for problems, and they're only for a season, only for a while. At the longest, may last in your lifetime. But compared to eternity, your lifetime is a blip, only a short time. And then comes eternity. God doesn't say that every, everybody needs trials. He doesn't say that. And He doesn't say that every believer goes through trials all the time. The measure of trials may depend on God's purpose for your particular uh, individual. For example, to be in the ministry. I may have to go through deeper trials to make me more like Christ so that I can serve Him than say you might or you might have to go through trials that I don't have to. But equipment used, for example, in exploring space is tested more vividly, more vehemently than, than is the equipment that's in your car, right? So if you're going to take a spaceship into, into uh, the, uh, without atmosphere, you're going to make sure it's in good shape, much more so than when you get in and turn on the air conditioner in your car. You figure there's oxygen somewhere. So we see here that the Lord, with His infinite wisdom, with His infinite love, tailors the time of your trial, the duration of your trial, the quantity of your trial, to fit every single one of His children. That is God's perfect will for your life. So His purpose for some may be greater spheres of usefulness. Maybe God wants to prepare you to do greater things and be more useful. For others, it might be disciplinary trials to remove sin, to get you past that worldliness that you've given yourself to. Or it may be to teach you correct behavior. How many times has the Lord said, I told you to stop? Uh, and I learned real quick, God meant what He said, right? So sometimes God wants to change your behavior. So let's look then at verse number 7. He talks about the purpose of trials. In verse 7, he says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory 
at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial is the test to determine genuineness and durability. When you go through a trial, God is showing you that your salvation is genuine. I've never had God closer to me than in the middle of a trial, a test. And I've never known God to be so faithful as when I'm going through a trial. Amen. Durability. Durability. And, uh, and, 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 uh, no, and genuineness of your salvation. So the trial examines the quality of your faith. By the time when some people go through a trial, they throw their hands up and quit. That's not real faith. Some people I have seen go through some of the most horrific trials and tests and come forth praising God and serving God and, and working for God because God had been faithful to them. Look at verse 6 for a minute. The question is, will your faith stand the test of dark days? Is your faith strong enough to help you through disappointments? Is your faith able to tear you through sorrow and criticism and rebuffs and physical pain and unrecognized uh, service where somebody doesn't recognize what you're doing? The Bible says in verse 6 that these are some of the manifold temptations or testings. We're all going to go through many tests as long as we're here on this earth. And the testing of our faith is more precious than gold. If you're like me, by the time I start a, a test, I say, all right, Lord, I learned it all. You can put, we can do something else now. The Lord may say, not until I'm through with you. I grew up around Williamsburg. Dave and Julia will be going to Williamsburg and Washington in the next week. But I grew up around Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. And I used to walk through and watch them at the smelting uh, place where they would uh, where they would purify silver and whatnot, and the question was asked, "How do you know when the silver is is pure?" And the person in the, the smithy would say, "When I look in the pot and I can see my face reflected in the silver, I know it's pure." You see, God watches you as you go through the fires of a trial, and when He can see His face, He knows you've come forth as pure gold. That's what I've always held on to, and I believe it to be true. Now, look at the phrase, praise and honor and glory. Peter, Peter may have meant that the believer will come forth with praise and honor and glory, but I really believe by the surrounding Scriptures, he's saying, when you come through a test or a trial, the Lord will come forth with praise and honor and glory. You will be God's trophy of grace. You'll be able to share your testimony of how faithful God is. So in verses 3 through 7, Peter told believers in Christ that salvation includes what it all includes, and then he describes the trials that they would have to face. Now I want you to look at verse number 8. He talks about the present joy of believers. Not only the present trials, but the present joy. First of all, the believer's relationship to Christ is our present joy. Look at verse number 8. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though, not, uh, though now ye see him not, yet believe. Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Neither we nor the believers to whom Paul, uh, Peter was writing... Uh, have seen Christ. They haven't seen Christ. I haven't seen Christ. But that shouldn't change our perspective. We don't have to see Christ to love Christ. We don't have to see Christ to rejoice in Christ. We do those things by what? Faith. By faith. So to believe only because we see something, that's not faith. But there's something else that we have. Not only do we have the relationship to Christ, but the believer also has rejoicing in Christ in verse number 8. Because of our relationship with the Savior, we can rejoice in the trials rather than being shaken by the trials. I don't care what you go through. You're going to be able to experience the fact that the Lord never leaves your side, that you belong to Him. 
and he uses the word joy unspeakable. And that means that the joy can't be even be expressed in human language when you go through tests and trials. He said the very fact that, that the Lord is with you, beside you, giving you what you need, gives you a joy that even your human language can't depict, can't predict, can't describe. This is the kind of joy a believer can have even in trials. Lastly, I want, to, I want you to see it's not only a present thing, but there's the future blessings that you're going to have too. As you go through your trials, what are the future blessings of the believer? Well, first of all, verse number 9 talks about the promise of your salvation. Look at verse number 9. He said in verse 9, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of of your soul. The end result of your faith in Christ will be the salvation of your soul. You've been forgiven for your sin. You're growing to be like Christ, but one day you're going to receive the glorification, which is the final product of your salvation as you become like Christ. All believers have salvation from the moment that they trust Jesus. But Peter's referring to a future aspect of salvation which is the time when the believer will finally be with the Lord. We're saved right now. We know the Lord is with us, but there's coming a day when we're going to be with Him. That's the final aspect. Then verse 10 through 12, the mystery of our salvation. Not only the promise that one day we're going to be with the Lord, but the mystery. Notice what he says in verse number, number 10. He says of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us, they, might, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look upon. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament prophets could see the suffering Messiah. And they could see the glorified Messiah. But they couldn't see what was in between those two things. And they looked and they looked and they looked to understand the sorrow and the crowning glory. But they didn't know about the thing in between, which is what? What Peter and, and his group and us, where we are now. That thing we call the church age. They could see that Christ would suffer. They could see that Christ would reign. But they couldn't see where we are right now in a very special time frame. And that is a church age. So the prophecies about Christ that God revealed to those prophets uh, were intended for a later generation. And did you notice that even the angels want to know about what you are privy to? The angels want to know about what it means to be saved. They are created holy beings. You know what it is to have God's grace and God's salvation. And the angels are watching you just to see what that means. What a blessing. Folks, listen. Trials are going to come in your life. They're inevitable. In fact, they are for your good. Look at verse 7. They are for your good and for God's glory. No matter what it might be. They are for your good and for God's glory. But these benefits can only result if you handle life's trials the right way. How many of you have ever gotten into a trial and you handled it wrong? God didn't get the glory. You weren't, you weren't uh, the person you should have been. You didn't handle it the right way. When you handle a trial or a test the right way, God, it's for your good. You grow. You become more like Christ. Christ can give you more things than you had before. But it also brings glory to God because the people that are around you 
can see that you went through that trial and God was real to you. And He gets the glory for never having left you. Yeah, this is a very special passage of Scripture and one that I trust that you'll take and read over and over again and use the outline that I've given to you that you might be able to study when you go through difficult times. Next week, we'll pick up where we left off and we're going to talk about something very special in the next part of First Peter. Shall we stand? Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to study your word. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bless us and those that attend by way of internet. We pray, Lord, that you help us as we share these words with others and we and we ourselves fall prey to difficulty. I pray that you'll remind us that the trying of our faith is more precious than gold. And when we come forth, we will come forth as gold to the honor and glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.